from Troy University, Sorrell College of Business, and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy, this is eConversations, a talk with leading experts in economics, business, and policy. Your host is Executive Director of the Johnson Center, Dr. Scott Bollier. Hi, I'm Scott Bollier, the Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Our, our center is a free market center committed to economic education, and today I'm here to talk with you all uh, about free market ideas and economic education, and we have a very special guest with us, M. Stanton Evans from Troy University, who is a professor here since 1980. Uh, he still comes back and teaches from time to time and is uh, one of the more distinguished journalism professors in the business. He has a long career with a number of uh, books that have been uh, authored, articles and awards that he's won uh, over his distinguished uh, career. We're just going to have a conversation today about uh, his uh, experiences, his um, development into one of the leading conser conservative journalists in the business, and talk to him about um, how he, uh, his, the evolution of uh, his own thinking and his experience and interaction with those ideas. Stan, it's great to have you here, and you. Uh, I really look forward to the next half hour conversation. Thank you very much, uh, so do I. Let's start uh, just with how you got interested in conservatism and what brought you to um, wanting to become a conservative journalist. Well, uh, I, didn't, I never even thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I am the child of the 50s, and uh, so the big deal was the Cold War. And uh, I was an anti-communist and so forth. And uh, I remember reading uh, 1949, uh, 1984, the George Orwell novel. I was, I was horrified by it. And I knew enough. I was only 14 then to know that this was about communism, maybe other totalitarian systems, but communism then. And that was the year that communists took over China. And I became very concerned about this. So I, was, I knew I was an anti-communist. I didn't know what I was for, and I was just against it. And so I had to start thinking about that side of it. And the more I thought about it, the more I became a free market, limited government person. And then I went to college and sort of got involved more with people there of the opposite view. I had not known many people like that before, and there were a lot of liberals where I went to college. And so that kind of annealed my, I guess, conservatism. I didn't even know to call it that. And then later, and you and I chatted about this off camera, I realized that if I were going to be a, a, a person articulating this point of view, I needed to know some econ, because so many of the issues involved were economic in nature, big government spending, taxes, inflation, jobs, I mean, housing, go everything we're dealing with now. This is 50-some years ago. And so I had been an English major in college, because I like to read, and I didn't like to work, so that was easy. <laughs> so, but when I got out, I, you know, I don't I haven't learned, you know, English major. What can I do? I really don't know a lot. And so I then enrolled in a graduate course at New York University in the fall of 1955 with Ludwig von Mises, who was a very distinguished, famous, uh, so-called Austrian economic professor. He was a professor, uh, the mentor of F. A. Hayek, who was won the Pulitzer, mm -hmm. uh, the Pulitzer Nobel Prize later on. And that really got me some training in economics. And I, I realized then that I was needed that kind of training for philosophical reasons, just to know where I was coming from, but also for professional reasons. Because if you're going to be a journalist and write about American politics and issues, 90% of the issues, and even more so now, or economic in nature. So that's kind of how I came to where I, where I am now. Can you describe the Mises Seminar a little bit? It uh, was in terms intense. Of its seriousness. It, yeah, well, first of all, most of the people there were not kids. I was well, probably the youngest. They were grown <laughs> men and women with graduate degrees of their own already, but of their own. But he was so uh, respected and so widely uh, uh, revered uh, in the, uh, the libertarian or conservative. Uh, movement that people who were 50 years old enrolled in the seminar just to learn from him. Mm -hmm. And he was a very, uh, very good teacher, but very, very uh, demanding. And uh, the, your listeners or viewers here probably don't know about this. He has a book called Human Action, which is like a thousand pages long. 
and very, very Teutonic and very, uh, there's a lot of abstract stuff in it. And the first part is something called epistemology, which he teaches you, he taught you epistemology, which means how do you know such stuff? And that's what we started with. And that was our textbook, this thousand page book. But he was a very, very good teacher in the sense that he, he really knew what he was doing and he was able to get it across. And of course, we all paid very close attention to what he was telling us. So I felt very honored. He, of course, he was, he's a man long gone now, but very privileged to, to be a student of his. And I did learn a lot from him. I took other courses too, but he was the reason I was there. Sure. Uh, when, when I uh, did some background research on you, you also spent time at the Foundation for Economic Education. At the same was, time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And during this period, were there a lot of uh, free market ideas floating around and a well, lot of people you could turn to and organizations not like FEE? Or not many. No? Okay. Not many. Uh, in fact, that's how I wound up at FEE. I was an undergraduate and when I started thinking about these things and I remember going into a most of the, the intellectual atmosphere was not as bad as some of it is now in, in many places. But it was just basically kind of mushy liberalism. And, uh, you know, government should help people, you know. And, 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 and uh, there was nothing, you know, intellectual, you know, feedback from any other source. And I found out about fee. I remember I was in an argument with my professor in a philosophy class. Uh, Paul Weiss, he was a rather famous professor, and he was a socialist. And I was kind of just, you know, I didn't know much, but I kind of reacted and you know, got in an argument with him. He was a good professor also in the sense he let you argue with him, and he was, you know, he wasn't, he wouldn't shout you down. Uh, and he challenged you, and so it was good. And after uh, I got done uh, with one class in 1953, <laughs> And another student who never said a word came up and gave me a card. It was a card for the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, it was then called. It's now called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, yeah. which was based then at FEE, the Foundation <laughs> for Economic Education. He said, you need to get in touch with these people. And I did, and I went down to their headquarters, which was in Tarrytown, New York. And they were very welcoming and gave us a whole bunch of books and free market materials, and we set up a library on campus called the Independent Library, where we made these books available uh, to the student body. We published a little uh, newsletter called the Independent, and we were just fighting the good fight as we saw it. And that was my introduction to FEE from that class. And then when I got out of, uh, when I graduated, which was two years later, I got a job offer from a man named Frank Chodorov, who was the editor of a magazine called The Freeman, which I think still is yep. out there. And he, that was based at Fee also. And he needed an assistant. And that turned out to be me. And I get, went to work like this for $320 a month. Wow. And you could live on that money mm -hmm. back then. And that was my first job out of college. And, uh, and I learned, and then when I got there, they were very free market, very libertarian and so on. I, that's when I realized I needed to do the Mises Seminar. So I, I did the Mises Seminar at night mm -hmm. after I got through my work day at, uh, at FEE, take the train from Tarrytown down to, mm -hmm. to New York, so, yeah, New York City. Sure. Let's uh, move ahead to 1960 and talk a little bit about your relationship with William F. Buckley um, and your involvement in uh, the development of some of the leading uh, conservative documents and documents that remain influential all the way to the present. Um, can you talk a little bit about sure. uh, your uh, interaction with him and his Absolutely. influence on you? And also while you're talking about it, maybe um, talk about where conservatism what you imagine conservatism being uh, in 1960, where it is now, and whether you th still yeah, think it's on yeah. track with your yeah. your and Buckley's vision of it. Well, first of all, to start with Bill. I knew Bill when I was in college also. He had preceded me in college by a few years. And so we had a, a club at Yale uh, in which uh, we invited in outside speakers. And the very first one we invited was Bill. The reason for that was when I was a freshman in 1951, he brought out God and Man at Yale. It was the year it appeared. And the campus just went berserk. 
I mean, they were just this absolutely outrageous book. Everybody was denouncing it. I don't think anybody had read it. And so I went and got it. And I read it. And I said, this is exactly right. This is what's going on here. And its thesis was, um, I remember that for all these years, that first of all, the, 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 the educational experience there was training people to be collectivists. And also it was anti-religious. Well, it's exactly right as I saw it. So I became a big fan of his. And he preceded me on the paper. I was on the Yale News and so on. And so he'd been the chairman of it. So he was a natural mentor to those of us, not just me, but others. And we got him up there to speak. And he's the one who encouraged us to do our newsletter, the, end of the, the thing I referred to before. And he even helped subsidize a little bit because we had no money. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to, and then after I had this job at uh, Fee, uh, in the fall of 1955 was when he founded National Review. And he called me up and offered me a job. And well, that was kind of more my cup of tea. The fee is great, I loved it. And Leonard Reed and Frank were great people for me, but I was more of an activist. And that was a very contemplative uh, approach. And the, the jokingly, people called us the monks on the Hudson. You know, we were, <laughs> We were sitting there thinking deep thoughts. That was fine. I, you know, I'm all for it. But it wasn't my temperament. And so, and Bill was a close personal friend. So I accepted his offer. And the, so that started our relationship, which lasted for as long as he lived. And so he was a huge influence on me and on the conservative movement. I would, I've said to people many times that there were two, there were two people who were individually responsible for the modern conservative movement, which elected Ronald Reagan and all of that. There were Bill Buckley and Barry Goldwater. And um, because Bill made conservatism uh, intellectually okay. Right. I mean, they couldn't, nobody could, could look down their nose at Bill Buckley. Uh, impossible. He was smarter and quicker. And, and I, I shared a platform with him many times. He was, he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so it was a long term, long time relationship. And I've had an association with the National Review ever since. Uh, I'm still on the match. I don't like them anymore, but started in 1955. Mm -hmm. So that was the background of that. Then the, you're referring, I think, to the founding of Young Americans for Freedom, mm -hmm. which was at his ancestral family home in Sharon, Connecticut. And that all also, all this stuff kind of dovetails, came out of the Goldwater movement in 1960, and I was there. Uh, the Republican convention in Chicago at the stockyards. And uh, uh, Nixon was going to be the nominee. Everybody knew that. And I was up there covering this for the paper that I worked with, Indianapolis News, where I'd been not very long, uh, for about a year. And uh, Goldwater was the, the one conservative leader we had at that time. And Nixon spent all his time catering to a man named Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York, and as one might expect from the governor of New York, was a liberal Republican of the, you know, the stripe of what we are now called rhinos, Republicans name only. And Nixon spent all his time catering to Rockefeller. He flew to New York from Chicago to meet with Rockefeller to compromise on the convention uh, platform. Well, this outraged Goldwater. And so he ran for, he, he declared himself to run as a protest candidate. And I forget how they did it, and it was just symbolic. But I was in the stockyards when that happened. And he got up on that podium and said, come on conservatives, let's take this party back. That's what he said. It was powerful. And a lot of things happened after that, but the first thing that happened was that there had been kids working with him and and uh, for him, and a bunch of them got together with him after the convention and said, and there were some adults, uh, we need to institutionalize this idea of we need some conservative activism, and that was the founding the the idea for the founding of YAF. Uh, and the meeting was held at his Bill Buckley's home in September of 1960, and I was there. And they asked me to write a statement about, you know, our credenda. What, what are we for? Just what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So I did, 
and that was adopted. It's called the Sharon Statement, and it's, it still holds up pretty well. And that's how that all came about. But more important than that was that the Goldwater movement literally in four years did that. And he was the nominee in 1964, but then he lost the election. However, out of that came Ronald Reagan, and the rest is history. Between Goldwater and the early 1960s and Ronald Reagan, of course, we have Vietnam, and then we have the 1970s. Um, yep. You were highly critical of Nixon, um, yes, even I was. in the 1970s. And as an economist, um, you know, I look at Nixon and Wage see a and lot of really bad Wage economic policy. Control. So, mm -hmm. um, did we need that period of? Um, just dysfunctional politics and war to produce a Ronald Reagan? I'm um, not sure we needed it. Yeah. <laughs> we sure had it. Right. Um, yeah, Nixon, I'm, I'm a mixed bag on Nixon. I, uh, some things, I, he was revered for what he did in the Alger Hiss case, but that was in 1948. And that's, I'm a big student of that era, you probably know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tip my hat to him for that. I mean, what he did was hugely important. But when he got into, you know, running for president and then being president, he had this uh, desire to, just like with Rockefeller, to propitiate his enemies. And so he got further and further away from where he started. And that was what I didn't like. And so, and a lot of us didn't. And, uh, you know, wage and price controls, creating EPA, creating OSHA, all these alphabet agencies, it came out of his administration. Uh, detente with the Soviet Union, Dr. Kissinger giving away the Panama Canal, you name it, they did it all. And so there was a, a, rebe a rebellion brewing against him within the party for quite a while. And then all the other stuff you're talking about, with turmoil on the campuses, and all of that certainly led to a desire for someone like Reagan. And of course, he was a governor of California from 1967 through 74 or 5. And those were the years of that unrest, and he was a pretty tough customer in dealing with those people, and that made him more popular than ever. And then he ran against Ford in 76. I supported him then. And that was laid the foundation for his 80 election. When we look at Reagan, um, one common perception of him, I don't know if it's a correct perception, uh, but it's a perception is that uh, yes, he was a tax cutter, um, but he spent ruthlessly too. Um, can you comment at all on well, yes, uh, uh, on, on, on Ronald Reagan's glad to ability to constrain spending? Yeah, well, let me subdivide it a little bit differently, but mm -hmm. come back to that. Uh, from my standpoint, there were then, and had been for a long time, two main categories. The social issues were not prominent mm -hmm. until later, so that didn't come up much. But there, from the beginning, there were two. One was the Cold War and the Soviets, and we were just backpedaling and you know defaulting and giving away countries right and left, and that was very disturbing to me as an anti-communist. The other was the domestic side, the growth of government, and so Reagan really both those issues were very much involved with Reagan's candidacy and presidency. I would say on the uh, so looking at those two categories, we he won. The first one, which was defeating the Soviets. He did that with a lot of help, but it was Reagan who did it. And, uh, but we didn't win the second category. The government kept growing. Now, the reason for that was twofold, uh, at least twofold. One was he did ramp up defense spending, and maybe that had to be done. But, but the other was, that, and I um, harped on this back then, and I still did later when I wrote about these things, was the entitlement program. These are programs for the benefit of your audience that are on auto autopilot. And uh, they're like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, uh, education spending, whatever, you know, which are determined by external indicators. They're not, you don't sit and say, well, how much do we want to spend on this this year? But it's already baked into the cake because if we have this many old people, uh, including me now, on <laughs> Medicare, sure. then they got to be paid for. It doesn't matter whether you appropriate the money or not. Or in fact, you have to in order to, or we used to, we don't do that anymore either. We just <laughs> print money. Uh, but uh, uh, that never got under control. It was never addressed really by the Reagan people. The so-called Reagan budget cuts, and you know this because this is your field, were actually just reductions in the rate of increase of spending. 
and that's in that's Washington lingo. Mm -hmm. That's a budget cut. If you're going to increase it a hundred billion and you're going to increase it ninety billion, they call that a ten billion dollar cut. Well, I mean, hello, you know, Alice in Wonderland, and everything is like that even more so now. We have now they're going to go after tax expenditures, which mean money they don't take from you is the same as if they gave it to you. And tax your health care benefits or whatever, you're more take away your mortgage interest rate deduction. And there's a theoretical argument for a flat tax that didn't have any deductions. But that's not what they want. They just want the money. They're not going to just settle for the revenue neutral. They want that money. And they mean the spenders in Washington. Everything is just sort of Orwellian you know, an in earned income tax credit yeah. is a check. Uh, the money that you would earn in your savings and investment is unearned income. Well, you know, this is total inversion of, uh, of uh, language, and it's not accidental. It's to confuse people as to what is going on, and it works. And so that's the way they play the game. But basically, they've locked in all the spending and unless you attack the, the underlying legislation, attack, handle, do something about the underlying legislation, you're not going to control the spending. Yeah. Much like uh, the Reagan revolution, there seems to be a little bit of optimism in the air uh, at the present moment um, that can be captured by the Tea Party movement and yep. some of the election uh, results that we saw in 2010. Yep. Um, much like the Reagan period, there was a period of uh, a lot of dysfunctional economic policy leading up to it. Um, Very similar. Very similar. You, it, during that period, you had high, high inflation and stagflation. We've had a weak economy, uh, deficits and debts that are unprecedented in terms All of their true. levels. Um, do, you, do you hold some optimism for what we're seeing on the political side of things it's right now? Uh, or is, is this just going to be an inevitable... Um, we slog through it, somehow survive it, and just watch government grow again. I don't think it, it's. I don't think it's inevitable. But what I don't see out there, and maybe he's out there. She's out. Who knows? It might be. I don't see a Reagan, and that's what you got to have. We do not have very strong leadership right now. We meaning conservatives, and that is what Reagan. Uh, given my long involvement in this, I, I was kind of spoiled because all my life, from the time I was in college until at least the end of the Reagan administration, there was a leader. Uh, it initially, initially been Bob Taft, Robert Taft, when I was in school. But then it was Goldwater in the latter 50s, 60s, and then it was Reagan. So we had this continuity, and so you could look and say, well, that's the guy, and so we need to work I don't see that out there now. And uh, so that's one difference. The other difference is that uh, just the, the system is so, it's all changing in many, many ways. Uh, much of it negative, but some of it positive. And the positive part, and you mentioned the Tea Party, is the new diversity of communications. When the Goldwater campaign was going on, there were three networks. Uh, there were four or five magazines, and, and, and if, if something wasn't reported in those outlets, it didn't exist. Now you've got the internet, you've got to talk radio, which is hugely important, you've got to Fox News, you've got all these different things that did not exist back then. And so I think that's where the Tea Party came from. I think if, if the media situation had been in, you know, last year, what, or in 2008 or 10 or whatever it was, um, 10, I guess, the, the big change back. The Tea Party would not have existed, I don't think, because they couldn't get the information. And now they can. You can t tune into, you know, WTBF here and hear uh, Sean Hannity and Mark Limbaugh and so on and, and get totally different information from what's, uh, what's on CBS or NBC. And uh, that's hugely important. And I think so that's a positive change. But the leadership is not good. I mean, look at what happened in the Congress. They're, they have a huge majority of Republicans, and yet they don't seem to be able to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. We have a few minutes left. I want to make sure that we save a little time here near the end to talk about uh, journalism. Yes. And uh, you mentioned in your last answer um, the evolving nature of what yeah. media is. Um, right. Speak for a minute to um, aspiring journalists and uh, kind of the challenges Glad they face um, at the present and 
um, what it's like being a conservative journalist uh, in today's day and age. Well, it's, it's totally transformed from what it, has. what it was when you came in. It's always been uh, always been a very much a minority position, mm -hmm. uh, even you know 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, let me just segue back to our main topic because it connects. To be a good journalist, you've got to whatever the delivery platform. It can be print, it can be electronic, it can be the internet, it can be a blog, I mean, it can be anything. But you got to have something to offer. you got to know what's going on to tell other people what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, then you're just wasting everybody's time, including your own. That's why it's important to know your econ. If you're going to be a journalist or anything else, uh, you can, any, any other subject, you need to have that substantive knowledge to understand the world you're living in in order to tell other people about it. One of the great problems with journalism, as I've seen it over 50, 60 years, is that knowledge often isn't there. And you get people like covering the gas the gas price. That's a perfect example. Why, you know, every single year, it's like, oh, well, it's the oil companies gouging. Hello, it's supply and demand, the pricing system, supply constraints, pushing price up. It's the way it works. They don't get it. And so they're interviewing people in gas lines about what's the conspiracy? You know, this is not helpful. Uh, people are not getting informed. Uh, they're being misinformed. And then that leads to political consequences, uh, like wage and price controls. That's where that came from. It came from the, you know, concern, oh, we need to control these prices. Well, it's a disaster. Uh, it doesn't work for reasons you know better than I. And so my advice would be, we're talking about information technology. The best information technology in the world is right here. And so I would tell my students, and I've had a couple of thousand of them over the years, uh, inform yourself, and then you can inform others. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sound advice. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we're we're near the end here, and you know I just want to make sure that you have time to um, tell us a little bit about where you're going in your own writing, and um, you know projects that you think are well, thank important you. ones to be working on in the next um, well, couple thank, of years. Thank yeah. you very much. I write books. That's mostly mm -hmm. what I do, and I've got I'm working on a book right now. If I ever get it, get it done, uh, these are Cold War type books because we now have records available to us mm -hmm. that were not available. But let me also say a word about where we're sitting, Troy University. I've been coming down here since Jimmy Carter was president, and I am a, a huge fan of this university. It's a wonderful place, and I feel very privileged to be here. And I'm so glad that you're here, because it's a, it's a, it's a natural, and, uh, and it's, a, it's always a pleasure to me to come back to Troy, and uh, I'm looking forward to coming back next year. Mm -hmm. So that's the... Uh, that's just my wrap up of where yeah. I'm coming from. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to having you here uh, as well. You know, we're trying uh, as a center to do more media outreach and to learn uh, from you a little bit how um, to get the exposure that we need in the way of um, economic ideas and, you know. Well, I'll leave the economic ideas yeah. to you. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to you about something yeah. else. But, sure. but I'd be glad to work with you guys any sure. way we can. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's really been a pleasure having thank you here you. today. Thank you. The pleasure yep. is mine. Thank you. E-Conversations is a production of Troy University, Sorrell College of Business, and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of Troy University, its administration, faculty, staff, or students. This has been a Troy Trojan Vision digital production.